Hello and welcome. It was Dennis Quaid's performance in Philip Kaufman's The Right Stuff about the heroics of the first jet pilots to crack the sound barrier that propelled the Texas-born actor to international stardom. While Dennis had already built up an impressive list of movie and TV credits, it was the global success of The Right Stuff and its recounting of the start of the space race and the original astronauts that won him global attention. Three years later, in 1986, he was cast as the lead in The Big Easy, a romantic thriller set amongst the corruption in the New Orleans police force. The film, which included some memorably steamy scenes with his leggy co-star Ellen Barkin, was directed by Jim McBride. However, the screenplay was not initially set in the seamy world of New Orleans crime. It was set in Chicago. Yeah. It's the same script. But you weren't involved then, were you? Uh, I came in just at the time that they changed it. I had a, it all, everything came together at once. Jim McBride was thinking about taking the script based on who he could get for it, and I came and had a meeting with McBride and Steve Friedman. And um, uh, there was in that meeting, McBride said he would like to change the script to New Orleans, and then I immediately picked up, perked up, because I've always wanted to do a film there. I'm from Houston. Oh, and I went to New Orleans on weekends, you know, during college and stuff like that. And the town is so rich, uh, and it's never been done. New Orleans has never been done right on film. Every time you see a film about New Orleans, uh, it takes place there. They always cut away to Bourbon Street and, you know, so a Dixieland band, which is dead and it has been dead long ago, like an amusement park. And they... Uh, so they've missed the real flavor of the town, and uh, the reason I wanted to do the picture, and I thought McBride could actually portray New Orleans for once, is what he did on Breathless. He um, portrayed Los Angeles in a way I'd never seen yeah. it before. Uh, I had some problems with that film, but I... Yeah, I know what you mean. I had some, <laughs> some definite problems with the film. <laughs> but uh, I liked the way he portrayed L.A., and I liked... So I said yes. Mm. Because then you had to, uh, the character then had to become, I mean, his background, his heritage changed as well, didn't it? Because you suddenly became uh, an Irish, sort of half Irish, half Cajun. Yeah. Which, uh, there's a a strange mix. The the New Orleans and the the accent down there is not Southern at all. It's kind of a combination of... uh, uh, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, Southern. Mm. So they had this kind of yak talk down there, you know, hey daddy, how you doing, you know, like that, you know. <laughs> the these, dads, and those, you know. But then the Cajuns, they also, they, they're from France, and uh, or Acadia, you know. Really. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cajuns and all, but they were separated uh, from the rest of the world for 130 years. They were driven out of. They were driven out of France during the French Indian War, and uh, came down to Louisiana to live. Well, there's bayous back there, and there were no bridges, and so uh, up until the time of Huey P. Long, who was the governor in the 30s, he built the bridges and opened it up. They were separated, and so if you're over 50 years old in Cajun country, your first language was French. Mm-hmm. You didn't even hear English until you were about five. Do, but do they still speak French out in the bayous? Oh, yeah. Right. There's some people who only speak French, too. Because what Jim did yesterday for me, which was very kind of him, he gave me a cassette of the music yeah. that they're looking at using. Yeah. I mean, I've, ha- I've had it in the cassette in the car yeah. for the last 24 hours. I've just been playing it. I love it. It's, it's really it. infectious, the music. Oh, yeah. You can't help but have a good time. And if you go to... Uh, if you go to the Mardi Gras, if you go, if you go to these little places, the, I mean, these people, what they do, like are in Mamu, which is the center of Cajun country, there, that little town. Saturday morning, they work all week. They're all farmers, and they work all week. But on Saturday morning at seven o'clock in the morning, they start dancing in the bars and drinking beer. And that place, the first place, closes at one o'clock in the afternoon. They go across the street to the next one. They go on there, and then every week they have some kind of festival, sugar cane festival or something. They all go out at night for that. They stay out till 5 in the morning. They're up at 8 o'clock in the morning barbecuing all day. You obviously went out there and, and got into this. Yeah. And uh, 
So uh, I mean, they take their they take their good times seriously. Yeah, right. Yeah. The only way it should be done. But are they today? I presume that they're kind of connected with the rest of the world. Television. I mean, they can they come cable in and, and all that. Cable, you know, yeah. It's it's very different nowadays. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the language is disappearing, which I think is really happening all over this country. In fact, because of television, because of like cable, that the accents are going to disappear. It's, mm. it's going to be just this eventually. One. It's going to be one accent. Which is a shame to me because the regionalism is oh, it's such a beautiful language the way they speak it. And um, I did that, and I went I went down a month before. I went to Cajun country on the weekends, and then, then I would uh, went around with the cops for oh, really? a month. Yeah, I really got to know the cops down there. Went around with the homicide and uh, like with uh, patrol cops, robbery cops. But was there real life elements of the of the kind of corruption that's portrayed in the film? Oh yeah. What was amazing to me is that the cops went around with down there. I was a little hesitant about telling them the story. <laughs> yeah, I should imagine. You know, here it has to do, you know, with bad cops, corruption. But one guy I find I finally kind of you know got to trust. He got to trust me. I uh, told him the story. And he went, yeah. Oh man, I'd love to see that. That's a real thing. <laughs> it was it got all excited because finally somebody was doing a real story. <laughs> yeah. You know, what sort of? I mean, while they while you were with them, were they fairly open about doing that sort of thing? I mean, going into a bar and I never saw yeah. it, mm. but it does definitely goes on. They tell me, yes, it definitely does go on. And there's a system that works down in New Orleans, especially. It doesn't not out here. Uh, but in New Orleans and in New York City, there's a definite system going on with the police in Chicago because the people who are, who are police were born in that town and they grew up in that neighborhood, so they know people. Mm. You know, So there's a definite system going on out here in L.A. People who are cops probably were born in the Midwest or something, so there's not that trust that you have between So. There, you'll have to pay off some things like that because a cop, I mean, if you look at a cop cannot raise a family of four on the salary that they get. I mean, I kind of see how it, this system actually works. Can't raise a family of four. You want to send your kids to college, too. And, uh, and there's, it also works out because uh, people get extra protection from the police, mm. uh, things like that. But then it does, there is a fight, but what the movie is also about is that where is that fine line that you cross between just a little bit of, exactly. you know, take and then to where this is like evil or, mm, you know. What's wrong? Yeah. And the thing is that it's all wrong, of course. But uh, there's a fine line. We all, there. I mean, uh, Australia is... Uh, but if you, I mean, if you, you know, when you look at, I mean, look at what we do, you know. We take gratuities for things that we do. I mean, somebody offers me... Uh, you know, I'll give you a free trip to the Bahamas if you come down here and just do an interview or something like that. I mean, I think of things like that. I mean, we all do that. It's only because you're a public servant that all of a sudden people are, you know, pointing a finger at you. That's right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, excuse me, I'm just going to say in Australia, the, the guy next door is a baker, so he brings home some extra loaves from the bakery and yeah. gives them over to the guy next door. Yeah, and right. he, in turn, happens to work at the, the local lawnmower place, yeah. so he gets... Parts for the lawnmower, so right. You know, we've all got our scam, yeah, one way or the other. Oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I think I, I said I said uh, to uh, to both Dan and Jim, I'm just seeing the 40 minutes and obviously not being able to judge how it's all pulled together. Yeah, uh, but it just it was so intriguing. I mean, I, I really wanted to sit there. Well, corruption is the way of life. Even the governor was just up. They tried to they tried to try him twice for corruption. In fact. For oh, this taking. is the guy for the yeah the governor betting or gambling or something. Yeah, Edwin Edwards. And in fact, they had an interview with him on the steps of the courthouse because they caught him. So the line and said, "Governor, you lied to the people." And he said, "It's a dirty job." That, that was his justification. <laughs> wasn't it? And well, he got off. And got off. He got off because he was honest. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh, Alan Barkin's an interesting guy. I, I again, I was saying to Jim, I couldn't. The first time I saw her in anything was with Bruce Beresford, or in Bruce Beresford. So yeah, Tender Mercy. She was wonderful. But she'd done a couple of things, I think, before then. Yeah, she amazing. was in uh, Buckaroo Banzai. She was in uh, Diner. Diner, that's right. Yeah, that's where you remember her from. 
And she has a movie out right now called Desert Gloom. Desert, mm. Desert Hearts, I know. In fact, I'm heading. Yeah, there's Desert Hearts, but there's Desert Gloom Desert too. As well. yeah. John Boyd and Joe Beth Williams. Oh, right. her. oh that's yeah. right. Yeah, I've seen it. And uh, yeah, she's really a wonderful but actress. It's really the really first. Well, again, for me, in terms of what I've seen of it, it's the first kind of really sophisticated role that she's done. Yeah. Is that is that right? I think it's the first role that she's had that you actually follow her character throughout an entire film. Mm. You know, complete through line with it, instead of being a, excuse me, instead of being supporting. Yeah. It's a striking, and, uh, uh, striking face that sort of is. Yeah. I mean, it's almost two two faces or something. Maybe it's the it lighting. is. Well, her nose is. She broke her nose. All right. A while back, and so. She looks different from... But it's a, it's a striking face. Once, yeah. once you see it, you, you yeah. don't forget it at all. Yeah, I, uh, in fact, the film to me is essentially it's a love story. It's kind of a forbidden fruit type of a love story mm -hmm. between a homicide detective lieutenant and a uh, assistant district attorney investigating police corruption. Mm. The um, A definite no-no. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Prior... Between um, Enemy Mine and uh, and The Big Easy, did you do another film? No. Oh. How I don't think. No. <laughs> how, how did Enemy Mine do here? Enemy Mine didn't do well here. Mm. Financially. How did it do in New Orleans? I mean, in uh, Australia. New Orleans. <laughs> in Australia. Yeah. Australia did... Um, it didn't do as well as Fox Columbia, which is the distribution company in Australia. It's yeah. Mine. Uh, expected it to do, yeah. But it, um, I think, it did just kind of middling business. Yeah. Well, I think it it, it didn't do all well. For one thing, uh, if you ask me, I think 20th Century Fox is about the worst that there is as far as marketing goes. Mm. They don't know how to sell pictures, and um, I think also maybe um, that people were burnt out on science fiction space movies by the, by the time yeah. they came out here. Which I think could have a well, it wasn't hard I mean, it was really, to do it was with a relationship movie. It is, but people didn't perceive it that way, and mm -hmm. it wasn't sold that way. It's a very, it's to me, it was like a small movie set inside a very large, yeah, well, that's a good description background. And I love it I myself. I'm very proud of it. Well, I think both of you ought to be yeah, because the performances are very good. In it. it was a year and a half doing it. Of doing it, because you started off. Did you start with Richard Longfellow? Yeah, oh. in Iceland. We were in Iceland for a month, yeah. and uh, Paul Richie was a good director. It's just uh, it just wasn't going to work in Iceland. It was ridiculous to shoot there. Nothing ever matched anything. Yeah. It was oh, horrible. So the look of the film on the screen that they had in the dailies was just they looked like Earth. So right. I mean, couldn't get away from it. I mean, the seagulls were going through shots and stuff oh, really? like that. It's kind of difficult. Yeah, it's a pity though. It's because uh, the idea. I, I after I spoke with you on the phone, I was then at, I don't know how much longer later it was, but I was then at, at Cannes and I uh, ended up talking to um, to um, the director. His name Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Wolfgang yeah. yeah, and he was great. I mean, he he was really um, well. He saw it as obviously as a major challenge, but he was really optimistic about. it the whole thing. Yeah. Um, well, I think it, was, it did very well in Germany, as I understand, and probably pretty mm -hmm. much in Europe. Because, you know, it, I believe the Never Ending Story didn't really do much business here. Not here either. They didn't it, sell it right here either. You know, it ran for 13 months in Sydney. Yeah. Really? Oh, huge. Picture. All over the world, it was a huge hit. Mm. But, pretty. Because uh, uh, you must have seen uh, Das Boot. Six times. Six times, yeah. The six-hour version. The six-hour version is yeah. on TV. In German. It's really quite incredible. Yeah, I imagine. The, the movie was just stunning. Yeah, I mean, I just sat and watched it. This is about the only thing, because I only had videotapes over there. And just, so I just watched it over and mm. over again. The, um, can I go back a little bit? How, yeah. how, how did both of you guys end up in the business? But, you know, my brother and I? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, with the family in it? Uh, no, my family wouldn't. I think my dad was really a frustrated actor. And uh, I think that's how we... We're kind of driven to it. You were driven to it rather than sort of finding it in high school plays? or. Well, we did. That we, we really kind of found it on our own, but at the scene, I think that he may have been 
like unintentional inspiration towards that because he never pushed us mm. out. He kind of, in fact, he said, you know, run, maybe you should really get a real job, you know, but, you know, because it seemed impossible, you know, when you're from Houston. Yeah. And now it's, that's my boy. <laughs> so did he play any sort of literal role, if you like, in organizing you into the business at all? Or? No, not at all. I mean, my brother and I, Randy got into, in high school, started doing plays, and then I did too, and we both were in the University of Houston, who was an acting teacher there, and it was, his name was Cecil Pickett, and he, uh, he really got us, you know, really inspired me uh, into thinking that's what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Randy had point, did, well. you have, did you have an idea that you'd you know, go and do law or medicine? I thought I was going to do music. Actually, and uh, in fact, my first year of college, I still thought I was going to do music. But after I was with Cecil Pickett, I, just, I really found out how much I really loved loved acting. Mm. So how, how do you get out of? I mean, how does anybody get out of Houston and get you know, here to get the, the work with it? Well, for one thing, you have to leave, which is very hard to do for a lot of people. It's a very scary thing to leave home. But once you realize you can starve here as well as you can starve there, everything's fine, you know. And I came out here, and I sent all my pictures out to every agent in town, and I got turned down by every casting directors and making meetings on my own with casting directors just to talk, just to get used to interviews. And uh, finally I met this one casting director who called up an agent, one that had turned me down already, and I I got an agent from that. And is it, I mean, it, after that, is it easy? Once you get the agent, is it then simply a matter of waiting for the roles to come along? Just it? waiting for the phone to ring, yes. So, but uh, no, it's. it took me to see a year to the day I got my first job in a film called 93055, which Jim Bridges directed. Right. And um, then I waited around for another nine months. Finally got another job, and then... Then it was another year before I got another job. Then finally, and in between doing what, taking acting classes, or was it? yeah, going to acting class, collecting unemployment, uh, things like that. Work, working obviously to put money in the to put uh, food on the table and so. Yeah, you know, but there was no. You know, I was living in a small apartment over in Hollywood with two other guys, one on the bed, one on the couch, one on the floor, and we just rotate once a week. And so there really, there really wasn't that many expenses at the time. Mm. And uh, but you were clearly com- you were clearly committed to to getting into the business. Oh yeah. Saying. Well, I, once I moved out of here, I I didn't told myself I wasn't going to work as anything else but an actor again. I, before that, I did uh, I was a clown in amusement park. I did stand up in Houston stand up comedy. I did. Uh, I was a Fuller Brush fan. I was a waiter. I was sold encyclopedias door to door for a week. For a week? For a week. I couldn't take it. (laughs) Oh, can I come in and screw you out of $500? (laughs) So what happened to the music? Because you obviously, I mean, you've played and sung in a couple of films. Well, yeah, that's what I figured is that I could probably, with acting, with just that uh, time being, it just seemed that I really had more of a chance of really making it and and, uh, and acting. Mm. But I've always written and things, and I figured that also that probably the two would merge, have more of a chance of merging one day. And like for the Ninth Lights when I'm George, I got to write four songs for that, which got used. Tough enough, I wrote a song for that. And um, in fact, my songs in uh, The Big Easy I wrote for that. Have you got a song in that too? Yeah, called Close, Closer to You. Over the decades, Dennis has gone on to have a wonderful career in both film and television, not only as an actor, but a producer as well. In that time, he's portrayed some very famous real-life people, including Jerry Lee Lewis, President Clinton, and, most recently, the late former President Ronald Reagan. His upcoming films include The Tiger Rising, On a Wing and a Prayer, and The Hill.